Joan has been part of the Compass Study since uh, before the grant writing. She was um, involved in some of the initial thinking and feedback to the clinicians here at Wake Forest, where her husband, uh, a physician here at the medical center, was treated after his stroke. She is a retired middle school teacher, and she often credits her ability to advocate um, um, due to her position as a middle school teacher. She's been a very <laughs> fierce advocate for, um, for Dr. Celestino during his recovery, and in particular while he was working through aphasia. So Joan has been um, heavily involved in training our post-acute care teams at the intervention sites. And uh, she was such a hit that when the control sites switch over to implementing Compass, you will meet her in person as well. And she's also been very involved in uh, developing the handouts that we have created for providers on communication, how to communicate with um, patients after they've stru- suffered a stroke. Um, and so one, one thing we have learned in, in sort of our listening to stakeholders throughout the study design is that everybody has a different perspective. And um, one thing that our stroke survivors highlighted very, very quickly was that currently the standard of care tends to forget family members and doesn't support them um, the way they need, they need to be supported. They are, they are sort of worn out um, in their caregiving duties. Um, in many cases, they themselves Um, or elderly or of poor health and taking on the responsibility of caring for a spouse is tremendous. Um, And it was our stroke survivors that that brought our attention to family members much more clearly than family members did. Our family members were constantly focused on the patient's needs and the patients were the ones that kept saying, don't forget my caregiver, don't forget my caregiver. It's actually in my best interest if you also support my caregiver. And so, Joan, why don't you just share briefly um, your thoughts on why it's so important to um, care? I know you are you are a, a loud advocate for patients, but also for other caregivers across North Carolina. If you could highlight for all the um, uh, members on the call why it's so important that we capture the caregiver's perspective in our survey as part of the study design. Well, I think my husband and I had... Um, probably a, a different picture than some others. We were fairly healthy right at about 60 years old um, and uh, my husband coughed too hard, had uh, bilateral dissection of the carotids and uh, they were happily ab- able to save his life but he did have a stroke. And from the point that that happened for quite a few months, even though He understood what was going on slowly, um, and he began to get his ability to move back. He was not able to control his rehabilitation. He had to have somebody strong who could see what was going on and move towards the determination that he could then produce. And so I think when we think about um, people with stroke uh, being uh, discharged from the hospital or from rehab and they come home, their success is maybe at the very beginning totally in the hands of their caregivers because the caregiver is the one who makes sure that the medicine uh, regimen is followed. They make sure that they get to the rehab things they need to do. They need to um, be right there for them to make sure any physical practice or occupational therapy, the practice is done at home. So it's really at that beginning part, really for the first three months, it is totally who is driving the um, the rehab and that is something that is sometimes missed certainly the patient should be the center of everything but what happens is the, pa- the patient often doesn't really know how to organize all of that 
And so I think what's happening is there is a, um, a, a drop from the caregivers, in, from the, uh, the hospital caregivers, between that and the actual family caregiver. Um, now, in our situation, I was teaching middle school. I was happily able to find a couple of sort of underemployed people in my church. And they came and uh, were with my husband while he um, needed somebody 24-7. And then I came home from my job and continued it. But the determination to succeed really came from me. And so it is critical that anybody talking about stroke realizes that the support and the resources at the beginning need to be really fully behind the caregiver. And, you know, as we've gone along, my husband has now done wonderfully. He um, happily talks about his golf game approaching, at least he's under 90 now, and so he's very pleased with that. But the major thing is now he can have goals and drive that. But at the beginning, it was in my hands. So, Sabina, do you want me to... Yes. Want to and, say and so I know at the beginning or? he was told he wouldn't um, be playing golf again. And so you, you've come such a tremendous way. And I do want to highlight, this is something Joan has said herself, that she and her husband were in a unique position compared to most um, families and that they were... Um, highly educated and had high income and access to resources that um, most people probably didn't have. And despite those advantages, it's a tremendous, tremendous um, burden to overcome. And one one last person who has said this to me is the um, Betsy Vetter, who's the head of governmental affairs for the American Heart Association here in North Carolina. And she she is probably one of the most resourced um, knowledgeable people um, around stroke and when she was faced with having to care for her husband after his stroke she said she was completely overwhelmed and so you have these highly um, motivated highly engaged highly resourced individuals um, who are overwhelmed and so when you consider the average um, uh, family the, the burden can truly seem overwhelming and you did, you mentioned this before, but also the health of the caregiver mm-hmm. in addition right. to the health of the patient mm-hmm. is terrifically important. Yeah, and so this is, this is why um, when we intervene um, through the COMPASS intervention, an, an element of assessing um, comprehensively how the patient is doing is pivoting to the caregiver and and going through a battery of questions with them to understand what their needs are to care for um, the, the patient because just exactly as you as you said Joan they are really driving rehab um, initially. Uh, Joan, do you have any other um, thoughts you want to share about the um, the importance of uh, having the uh, nurses and and the hospital staff you know touch base with the um, caregivers? Well, I, I think that that um, stroke is a, a devastating um, condition and to recover from it requires a tremendous amount of hope and determination. And it is always everybody's goal to infuse that into the stroke survivor, but it is critical that somebody help get that into the caregiver as well. And I think that the medical community is much, um, is, is really too afraid to give hope. And I think that it would, it, it's, a, it's it, it, the only way caregivers can go on is if they think there is hope. And so uh, they need to, to um, know, understand where somebody might be able to move and how they will be able to move forward. And also the idea that 
um, stroke improve, uh, improvement after stroke can go on for years and years and years. So um, my husband is now four and a half years out and um, he has pretty good movement, but his hand was still a little bent. Well, he decided he'd go to acupuncture. And, you know, that's now improved. And at each stage, we visit people and they say, oh, you are so much better than you were last year. So his attitude is totally, his attitude of what he can do and how it will be in the future is totally defined by the recognition that improvement continues. And so I think that that's a, a critical aspect of dealing with um, the stroke survivors, but also with the, the uh, caregivers themselves. One thing we do wanted to highlight, right, was the the necessary the, the, that it's necessary to to get the caregiver survey completed, um, because what what makes Compass unusual is that it, it it's assessing the needs of um, the family member caring for the patient in addition to the patient, and so we we want it's our secondary outcome that we reduce family strain um, through the Compass intervention, and so it, it's it's absolutely important that we get the surveys that we're mailing out to uh, patients across the state, I'm sorry, to the families across the state, returned to us in a higher, um, in a higher rate than has happened so far. But, um, we should turn the, the phone over to Barb, too. Hi, everybody. I'm glad to be on the call. Um, I've been involved in Compass uh, since it got funded, and so and have done a lot of work around caregivers um, and the importance of assessing not only the patient but the caregiver. So that's uh, what we just wanted to talk to you briefly about today, uh, on top of what Joan has already shared with you. So next slide. So as Sabina just said, uh, in addition to the focus on the stroke survivors and and the outcomes that we're looking at for the stroke survivors, we're also um, looking at provide at outcomes related to caregivers, particularly around strain or burden. And so um, in the in the intervention, we do have um, some mechanisms to provide some support to this to the caregivers uh, through providing uh, resources um, and and information on the Compass website. And then at the end, at the 90 days, we do um, an assessment of what kind of caregiving they're doing and um, and then do this caregiver strain index. And that's the, the survey that gets sent out at 90 days. Next slide, please. So um, the caregivers are contacted by um, Compass personnel um, when the patient's discharged to try to get reliable contact information and, and their relationship to the patient. And so that's something that we hope you all are able to do is to get us the most reliable um, information you can related to that. We know sometimes those people change, like you might have a an adult daughter that's providing care and then maybe as the patient gets a little better then then maybe the spouse can take over or maybe there's not somebody that's doing much of the care anymore, but we'd really like to try to capture as many of these as we can, and as Sabina mentioned, our um, rates of capture haven't been as good as we had hoped, so um, uh, again, that's one of the things we, we wanted to kind of stress so that you can understand the importance of that. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the questionnaire that we send at 90 days um, gets some just demographic kinds of information related to the caregivers, and then it does. An, uh, we do a brief assessment of um, of the care they're providing and the amount and um, of time and frequency of their um, post-stroke caregiving, and then we do this standardized caregiver strain index. Okay, the next slide. 
and and I if you can hear that phone in the background I apologize um so this just gives you if you can see this for those of you who can see this it just it provides a list of the kinds of things that caregivers may be required to do once the patient goes home so we ask if they're helping we ask if they need assistance with that and then we ask also if this was something they were doing prior to stroke because we got some feedback from some of the caregivers that they this was not a new task for them they had always helped with driving or they'd always helped with preparing meals or or the housework or whatever so um, so we wanted to make sure that we were able to separate that out so this is this is the survey that gets sent out this is part of it and then um, next slide And this is the Caregiver Strain Index. This is a standardized tool that uh, is available. It's, uh, it's a validated tool, and I think it's about 12 or 15 items. It's pretty easy um, for them to fill out. And it, uh, like I said, it's been validated in uh, studies with stroke patients before. So uh, this is what we're asking them, again, to, um, to complete. And and when they get that 90-day questionnaire. Next slide. So as Sabina mentioned, we've had a really low response rate. Um, and so we're really trying to figure out some mechanisms to try to improve that, uh, especially um, with the usual care sites because we, we have so such limited contact both with the stroke survivors and their caregivers. And so we think some of these are potential explanations that the caregivers don't think that this pertains to them, uh, that if the patient uh, that doesn't have a lot of functional limitations and they don't require extensive or long-term caregiving then the caregiver may think well I don't need to fill this out because it you know it's not applicable uh, or that they were providing similar care before the stroke and now after and so they think well this isn't any different so why would I fill this out or again as the care the caregivers may change over um, from the time of discharge to when we send the follow-up so next slide. Um, what we're really interested in is any ideas you can give us to um, uh, to try to better get these, you know, try to engage these caregivers or things you can think about to make sure that you really connect with them uh, before they're discharged so that when we send the 90-day survey, we do get it back. Um, and you can also emphasize the importance, you know, reminding them that they will be getting this and would they please send it back in or, or tell the, the patients if they're able to understand, um, you know, that this survey will be coming out and could they please encourage the caregivers to complete it for us. So I, I'm hoping some of you will also have some suggestions about how we can um, better capture this, you know, get the caregivers to to complete this tour.